eventually they develop a straightforward plan. Swim each boy out of the cave, accompanied by a dedicated diver. One of the biggest challenges will be preventing each child from succumbing to deadly fear while traversing vast stretches of black water. One of the things that the operation was afraid of was panic. Inside any kind of overhead environment, such as a cave, panic usually leads to instant death. He's gonna breathe, he's gas faster, he might take equipment off that he shouldn't do, and he cannot bring the panic diver up to the surface. First, they have to reduce the fear of drowning and ensure a reliable air supply. It was decided that we had to find full face mask. So having a full face mask allows the kids to breathe both with their mouth and with their nose. The kids then were using a full face mask and they were positioned in such a way that the head was facing down. So that also allows the, the UK diver that was bringing the kid out to kind of protect the kid. Whenever there was an obstruction, such as a rock or something, the diver would hit the rock instead of the kid hitting the rocks. But even that may not be enough to protect the boys and keep them calm. So they decide to add one more precaution. Each boy will be sedated for most of his perilous journey. Inside the cave, Dr. Pack is joined by Dr. Richard Harris, an Australian anesthesiologist and cave diver. His task will be to administer the precise dosage, enough to relax the boy, but not so much that breathing becomes compromised. Finally, all is ready. Early morning, Sunday, July 8th. The first major rescue mission is primed to begin. There are now five flooded areas of the cave, with shallow canals and relatively dry areas in between. Dozens of divers' air tanks have been positioned along the route. U.S. airmen assist building rope rescue systems in key chambers. And 13 ambulances, one for each child and their coach, wait outside. Everybody, especially the boys' anxious parents, are desperately hoping there will be survivors in need of them. You don't know how things are going to go because this has never been done before. You can have a pretty good plan, but something this complex with these many moving parts, it's, it's never going to go exactly as planned. Now it's up to Dr. Pack to prepare the boys. I explained every single detail so that they could understand, and also it was a good way to assess their mental state, whether they were ready to do this or not. And everyone was okay with it. Everyone was ready to leave the cave, whichever way. The Thai government has not commented, but the boys are believed to have been administered with a mild cocktail of the sedatives Valium and Ketamine to calm them and create a state called dissociative anesthesia, meaning the boys will be able to breathe by themselves but won't be conscious enough to panic or do anything dangerous. The rescue begins at the boys' location, dubbed Chamber 9. All along the route, different rescue teams are stationed, nervously poised for the big moment. The divers from the British Cave Rescue Council take turns swimming the boys through the flooded areas. They dive alone, about 30 minutes apart, for stretches as long as 15 minutes or nearly 1,200 feet, and through areas as narrow as two feet. When the British divers reach a dry section, other divers take over and carry the boys out of the water to the next dive location. In the flooded depths of the cave, the so-called Euro divers, Yvonne and Eric, 
are sent to man chamber six. The Euro team's uh, role at that point was to go into uh, the area called chamber six, which is roughly halfway into the cave. When the rescue diver, the UK diver, and, and the kid came to our position, we assisted them by with changing their tanks and also making sure that the kit was still in good condition. One of the things we had to do, the kids were using something called a full face mask. And we needed to make sure that this mask did not leak at all. Obviously, if any kind of water was to come into the kid's mask, that could have meant drowning. But before Ivan can even reach his post, he runs into trouble. About one minute into the dive, maybe even less. My helmet somehow gets trapped in the ceiling above me, and the two short strap is strangling me. And I know that letting go of this rope is not a good idea because I will lose my orientation totally. But I also know that not breathing is a really bad idea. And I choose to let go of the rope so I can use both my hands to undo the strap. I get the helmet off, get it free from the entrapment in the ceiling, and then I go to the position where I think the rope is, and it's not there. I find the rope again after 45 seconds or a minute or something like that. It felt like a lot longer. Ivan makes a narrow escape. Now he and Eric wait in their chamber for the first diver and the first boy to surface. You're sitting in the darkest place in the world. And when you're in there for longer periods of time, your mind starts playing tricks on you. There's a couple times that me and Ivan sort of popped up thinking that you know, we saw a light down there and give a yell, get anything back. Now I can see the light from the diver and I can see the silhouette of the UK diver and I can see that he's holding on to something, dragging something to the water. When I get to about five, six, seven meters, I can see that from whatever it is he's carrying in, in the water, I can see bubbles coming up to the surface, which obviously indicates that the kid is still breathing. And that was probably my best experience on, on this entire mission. When the divers and boys escape the flooded part of the cave, they are met in chamber three by US Air Force rescuers. The scariest part about this is I had no idea the condition of any of the boys or the coach. There was a good chance that any one of them could have come up and been dead. I would turn the child so that they were face up towards me, and I would listen to make sure they weren't working too hard to breathe. It's still nearly half a mile from chamber three to the mouth of the cave, where the ambulances are waiting. In one section, Rescuers use a high line to haul the boys' skedco, a special stretcher, up a steep slope. Once they hooked up the child to the skedco, and we started bringing them across with the safety line, there's two spots where there was these rocks in the way where we had one guy just help assist them up and pull them over very carefully, right? Because it's super slippery, it's dark, you know, everyone just has their headlamps. I kind of felt like the entire thing was mission impossible. The SCED stretcher was passed off to the Navy SEALs who had an army of people in there to do a human chain to pass the sled all the way down. The rescued boys are rushed one by one to the hospital by ambulance or helicopter. Their parents begin to get word, but aren't told which children have been rescued or who's still in the cave. Every time the children were brought out, we hoped it would be our child. All the time they were coming out, we were hoping. By the end of day 18, Tuesday, July 10th, all 12 boys and their coach are free, and all are healthy. Against all odds, the 18-day ordeal that had people around the world fearing the worst has ended in a miracle, thanks to an audacious rescue. All 12 boys, every child from that soccer team has been rescued. It's an unprecedented triumph. 
But as the world celebrates, inside the cave, there are still dozens of rescue workers. And nearly a mile and a half into the mountain, Dr. Pack and three Navy SEALs still need to escape from the boys' location. They begin their exodus, and not a moment too soon. Crucial pumps diverting the water give out, and levels begin to rise. I thought it would be easy to dive out, because they were pumping the water away. But seven out of the nine pumps weren't working, so there was a lot of water flooding in. By deciding to leave equipment behind, the rescuers make it out in the nick of time. We finally get out of the cave, and that's when you could finally be excited. I mean, you were, you were completely exhausted, but it was exciting. There was rows of people cheering, high fives, flashes. I brought a little bit of KFC in for us. I think there was a little bottle of Jack Daniels. I guess when I got passed around, and everyone had a little celebratory zip. <laughs> I mean, it was just lots of hugs. The thousands of volunteers from Thailand and around the world pulled off a miraculous rescue entirely against the odds. A marvel of bravery and human endeavor. Just on a personal level, I've got four kids. To see 12 of these kids and then the coach get rescued was incredibly satisfying. I feel so proud to be part of it, one of 10,000 people who made this mission successful. It makes me happy to see that there are great moments like this in the world. Being part of changing the, the impossible to the, to the possible, and that, 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 feels, that feels great. Yeah. Feels great. Knowing that you might see a, a dead child come up out of the cave was really challenging. And uh, yeah, seeing 13 boys come out, whoa, and uh, four seals, that was, that was pretty amazing. This incredible story of human endurance riveted the world's attention. We are coming. Many people are coming. It was a testimony to the resolve of the people of Thailand and showed us all what can be achieved by combining sacrifice, bravery, and teamwork with innovation and technology. But much more than that, the amazing Thailand cave rescue gave 12 boys and their coach a future many feared was lost.